thank you. Um, yes, I uh, am I on? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. So, uh, yes, dear friends, this is the sixth time um, uh, that we meet to to hear how you are doing and how also how how I can help you to further walk on this path. Um, I will in the beginning. Uh, tell you what um, uh, what I've been doing since last time because I uh, was invited uh, to London to give some lectures and workshops in, in Schrödelsteiner House in London and in Emerson uh, College close to London uh, and uh, it was uh, very much discussed the relation between the so-called Mikael path and the so-called Vidar path, or you might also say the 19 lesson path in relation to the Nordic path. Because in in uh, one of my, uh, or the first book on uh, on um, the Nordic path, Vidar said that the Mikael path did not work very well today. And when I, and I sort of uh, brought this, um, this information on and that created uh, and have created a problem or a discussion or a pro at contra discussion within uh, between uh, between um, uh, the especially uh, well the groups that say we will uh, go the Mikael path because that is the certain or secure path path uh, and those who say well we can go any path. And uh, it was written an, uh, an article that is published both in English and in um, and in uh, and German by uh, uh, Mr. Rose, <clears throat> who uh, is a little uh, upset or or, or angry or uh, whatever with that uh, statement that the Mikael path is closed. So I, because of that, because I was then going to, to, to London and also meet uh, the London Council or Forstand there, uh, I used a lot of time to investigate this, this different paths into the spiritual world, which was the title of my London uh, lecture. And um, when I then went the path through the elemental world over the threshold and from the, from the spiritual world or beyond the threshold, turned around and watched where people were entering or where people were striving to, to enter the spiritual world, I sat there for <clears throat> about three weeks. Uh, it was quite clear that there were three paths into, or three doors into the spiritual world. Uh, one was in the middle, which was the path that I had followed. And one was to the left which uh, a path or a door that was sort of um, somewhat darker and one to the right that was brighter. The middle was neither dark nor bright. 
and I was uh, watching that there were several paths, paths, paths to these three doors. At that stage, I discussed this finding or this observation with some friends, and I was sent a lecture held by Rudolf Steiner in Dolnach on December the 1st, 1918, GA 186. And there he described exactly this, um, the same, and he said there are there are three doors into the spiritual world. The door of death, the door of the elements, and the door of the sun. So this door to the left that I had observed, that was a little darkish, was definitely the door of death. This path, uh, there were several paths to this door, and they were um, also followed by some black uh, left-hand magicians or, or, or people that didn't have the, our best interest in mind. Then we had the door to the right, which was very bright, which probably is what Rudolf Steiner called the door of the sun, which was very bright and 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 um, and sort of secure, you might say, safe. And this uh, one of one of the paths that led to this right side door was uh, followed by several anthroposophists and i would suppose this is the door the path of the 19 lessons or what is called the mikael path and then we had the door in the middle the door through the elemental realm through the three elemental realms the elemental world which I am quite sure is the one that Rudolf Steiner called the door of the elements. It's even the same name. So um, I was then watching who was walking on this through these doors, and through the door of the sun, there were some walking or, or on the path there, but not many. So uh, they were most on the middle path, the door of the elements, and quite many also on the door of death, because it seemed that that also included death itself. Not only a, a introduction of the forces of death in, in uh, while you are alive, and also uh, those people who uh, used killing as a way of initiation, like Rudolf Steiner describes for the Mexican mysteries. They were also walking through the door of death. So uh, then I corrected what I had been writing that uh, the uh, do uh, the Mikael path or the nineteen hour path. Or that school of Mikael was closed. It is not closed, but it is quite difficult, and it seems to be more and more difficult in our modern times. And the, the problem is also if few people walk on a path, it uh, happens just like in our world, it uh, grows over by by weed and uh, branches and and and, and um, it 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 become difficult. The more the less people go walk on the path, the more difficult it it is. So uh, that I have um, 
have corrected in my in the last book that will soon be published by uh, Temple Lodge, uh, which uh, title will probably be uh, Further Teachings of Vidar. Um, in England, as I stayed there almost a week and had two seminars, uh, it was quite obvious and that we ourselves stop ourselves. We, we stop ourselves. We are our, our own worst enemies on this path of the elemental realm through the elementals because we again and again and, <laughs> and after a while in, in London and Emerson, they said it themselves and I come to this point and then I stop myself. I came to this point and of course I stopped myself because we have this path through the elemental world. And as I also said again and again last time on the fifth, um, the fifth um, meeting, that as soon as you stop and think and consider and put a concept on what you see, you stop yourself as soon as you do that. So the one of the the main uh, th uh, main learnings from Rudolf Steiner's book, A Philosophy of Freedom, is that we understand the um, difference between a concept and a percept, and when we put a concept on the percept, it becomes dead it become intellectualized and dying as a living thought as a living thinking and to pass through the elemental realms third and the second and the first we need to have a living thinking or a living perception so i guess that is still what most have a problem with that is that they stop themselves in this path. And there have been some questions that uh, I was sent that uh, <clears throat> I understand now that I should have gone into a certain web page to answer these questions. But I, uh, I was sent them. Uh, and uh, and have read through them and it also is there that the, the answer to most of these questions is as last time because they stop uh, walking they stop the progression on this path then it all stops and becomes stagnant yeah that was the um introduction to this sixth meeting from me and um, and then we um, can hear if there are any questions today yeah dear friends if you have a question uh so there is an icon, a little icon reactions in the bottom of your screen. So if you click on it, and there is a little button raise, raise your hand, electronic hand. Yeah. Okay. So I see we understand. And uh, Joe is the first. Yeah. Joe, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on the fact that in the, in the book, The Road to Self-Knowledge, which is now translated A Way to Self-Knowledge, in the postscript, Rudolf Steiner says that it's fairly easy to get first um, impressions of the spiritual world. But as you go along, it gets harder and harder, and the way in which you entered the spiritual world doesn't work anymore. 
and you have to work harder and harder at it. And that's when people give up. Yes. And, <laughs> and he explains that very carefully, that you have to work harder. It doesn't just keep happening all the time, the same way you did it the first time. The question is, and I've come to that point myself where I've discovered that the, the same reactions that I had in the beginning, which were much easier, are getting harder and harder, and I have to work at it much more difficult in, in much more uh, focused and concentrated way to get to the same results again. Yes, I totally agree with you, Joe. Um, um, still, still. Uh, the still is why is it harder and harder? Does Steiner say any specific about that? Yes, he does. He says the spiritual world is not like the physical world. When you when you are trying to develop something, you work at it and work at it and work at it, and it becomes easier as you do that. He said the spiritual world doesn't work that way. <laughs> It works the yeah, opposite but, way. But, but why? Why? How? Why? That's just the way the spiritual world is. <laughs> well, I, 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 what I observe from you or many or who work with this path into the spiritual world is that they, if you first have a concept on something, let's say you see an animal and okay, that's the moose. And next time you see uh, even a movement, oh, that's the moose. Uh, it's, it's so easy to put this concept. I think there is actually the mechanism of making it harder. Because we experience something and then at the first time we experience it, there we, don't, we do not have a concept, actually. And then next time we know, oh, there it is again. And then we put the concept again. And then we stop ourselves more and more easily. We stop ourselves self more and more effectively. I think I'm, that is the mechanism. I think that's absolutely right. Because I find myself having to erase concepts in order to get back to that state again. And, yes. to, and also, when you try harder, it doesn't work. <laughs> you, have no. to, you have to get back into that completely... And Steiner uses the word in that book, yes. um, submission, when you have sub submit yourself right. to the etheric world, to the, percep to yeah. the percept. Almost like I, what I was going to say, you have to sort of, you cannot work harder and harder, you must sort of let go. Right. And you float in and, and just watch what you see without any concept. When you see a movement, you just observe it it is like i think it's very very good uh, to describe it as uh, when you swim in the sea and you see something on the bottom you cannot stop you have to continue swimming you cannot stop and look at it and you drown and that is also on the way into the spiritual world we have just to float in and observe and do not put concepts then it in my opinion, is not more difficult, but it is difficult not to put concepts, of course. That is a difficulty. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so Susan is next. Susan, go ahead. Sure, hi. Um, yeah, I appreciate, Aura, that you, that you bring this, uh, discussion of this concern that people have raised about the school of Michael versus the what you're calling the Nordic path and <clears throat> you know my my own sense of all of this is that you know in in the Michael school and the 19 lessons the the path of the elements and ethers is there it is within those 19 lessons and you know along with some other things <laughs> So for me, um, it's not that they're necessarily separate paths or schools, but that there are many that 
walk the path of Michael that are still, shall we say, on a conceptual level with it. You know, they're still working at the level of concepts, which can then become dead, as opposed to living thinking. And the part, you know, you were just speaking about, well, what's hard? What makes it hard? And I think the piece that many people find difficult is the effort it takes to create a living imagination, which is to create a living etheric structure, you know, to create a vessel, as it were, that you then empty, you know, which is one of the very basic forms of meditation, as we learn through anthroposophy, is to create a, a meditation with a symbol or with a mantra and then hold the structure empty and allow to receive. And so this piece that you're speaking about, the fading and the receptive part, this is the letting go, which is the most essential to achieve, you know, well, shall we call it new results, new experience. Um, but it kind of presupposes that one has strengthened those faculties before um, to be able to attain that point of living thinking that one has actually been creative in a certain way in the etheric realm already in order to achieve perception in said realm um so i don't see these as necessarily conflicting or differing paths or that one is more closed but but yes many people who go at it in a certain way find a, a stop an end point where they can't go further whether it's through the door of perception, you know, the fading, or or whether through it's the door of people trying to wrap their minds around the mantras of the 19 lessons. Yeah, many people find difficulties on, on any of these paths, but ultimately the paths all lead to the spiritual world and to very similar results. And so I'm just trying to share those thoughts. I think it's all important. And, you know, the things you're teaching about working through perception to go directly into the elemental world, to then get through to the etheric world, that is one very important aspect of the modern path of initiation. And there are also, like you said, other ways, you know, there are ways that are, shall we call it more Rosicrucian in, in style or or other paths but they they all kind of blend together they have aspects that strengthen each other so that's just what i wanted to share and to thank you for your openness to how you're handling the challenges that come your way uh thank you uh for saying this uh and i find what you say very valid but uh although there are indications that there are um, different entries into the spiritual world. For example, uh, Johanna von Kaiserling asked Rudolf Steinig, can we go through the elemental world? And he said, yes, it's possible, he said, but it is at the time being uh, dangerous or too difficult because it is somehow closed at that time. And on the December the 1st, 1918, he said there are three doors and we can go one door or we can go the other door or we can go the third door. But to get a full um, clairvoyance or insight into the spiritual world, we have to go all three. And that means that there are actually not one path with different shades as you might have uh, expressed it or different uh, aspects there are actually you enter the spiritual world through the elemental realm at a different place than through the so-called 19 lessons so it's not exactly the same but you can go you can follow both that is totally possible and according to Steiner we should actually follow all three paths or doors into the spiritual. But they are 
actually different. It is not just one big door with many paths. There are three doors with each door have a number of paths. So, um, and when I, because in, in my life, I have tried both these three doors, the door of death, the door at a certain level when I almost have been dying sometimes, and the door of, uh, of course, the sun where I didn't come all the way, but the door of elements that suited me much better and it was much easier. But when I had gone through the door of the elements, it facilitates, it makes it easier to, to go on the other paths. So you can, so Steiner is very right in that. And they say, you, you should go all three. Yeah, a, a little common. So I told, I agree in most you say, but I think there is a, a still a certain difference between the doors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Ari, um, one of the participants asking, maybe you can tilt towards you, your uh, your screen. Yes, exactly. Because, because I don't see myself, so I don't know how to put it. <laughs> okay, now it's perfect. Okay, okay. Yaya is next. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you for being here with us. And second, I find that um, one of the reasons why I stop myself is because having had several times experiences of being incredibly close to death, I find that it is a scenery, if you like, very familiar to me, and I find it comfortable, comfortable to an extent that makes me fear that I'm too comfortable with the door of death because it has happened to me about nine times to be very close to death. So I know exactly what that feeling of letting go is because I've experienced it so many times and very consciously too, but without when it was happening, it wasn't the type of consciousness that prevents the happening. But now when I try to do the exercises, I feel this uh, tendency towards that door. Um, and it makes me slightly fearful of actually going through death when it's not exactly, hopefully, my time yet. Mm. So that means, tells me that you are sort of, because of your history, you sort of switch over to the path of death, the door of death, while you should mm. have been at the middle door. Yeah. So you, you go to the left, sort of. Uh, mm. So you, you must keep to the, to the right, uh, mm. doing an effort of, because the path to the door of death is is actually quite different uh, than uh, the path to the door of the elements. You have to go go through uh, the the, ex the external nature, the the uh, macrocosmic uh, things. You have to go through, let's say, the blue of the sky, the uh, plants or trees, and they are quite full of life. And you meet this life as elemental beings that is quite form and and, 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 and and vigorous. And when you then sort of keep to that, you will not slip into the uh, because I understand exactly what you, you what you mean because I, I I do that sometimes myself. But but you have to keep sort of with a with a, a life uh, willing, a life willing, yes, that is the right word, a life willing, and then you keep to the middle path, the middle door, 
the door of the elements. That is what I could yeah. comment on that. But I, I understand exactly what you, you say, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you, can you, I you, just you... add one, uh, one thing? A couple of days ago, in the state between being awake and falling asleep, and then again, the following morning between being asleep and waking up, I had a sort of feeling that somebody was telling me that I can do it. Um, a sort of encouragement. Mm. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know whether um, it is actually true or not. Hmm. Uh, but I, I felt encouraged, so I, I, I certainly will uh, carry on. Try to be aware of your right side more. Because okay. the door of the death is on the left side. Yeah. Try to sort of go a little to the right. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Leon is next. Leon? Uh, yeah, just unmute your machine, please. Sorry Excellent. about that. Um, I was saying hello, Ari, and everyone. Um, this conversation raises so many questions in me, uh, but I'll just raise one. It's a suggestion that as we study anthroposophy, we use the word understanding a great deal. And we strive to understand what Steiner is saying or, or in, in his lectures. And this process we're trying also on this path and it doesn't work. Um, we've just had a speaker here in uh, Chicago who emphasized the middle portion of the foundation stone where it talks about the presence, the, 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 um, the sensing, the immediate experience and uh, understanding is literally understanding that, standing underneath it. Uh, the word in German is not quite the same, and it's Verstehen, which has possible other interpretations, like more standing in front of it, as it were. And uh, for in my own case, part of my hesitation about things has been caused by a history of migraine, which creates visual distortions. And I'm asking, are, are, is it, are some of these this or that, rather than just being with it. So I just wanted to share that as well. Any comments on that, Harry? Yes, yes. Uh, it was <clears throat> very, I'm very happy that you mentioned the foundation stone meditation, because when I was in, in, uh, in England now, just a week ago, I got um, a mail or a message from Robert Kilder, uh, a Dutch anthroposophist, who said that he had just read my book on the northern path of initiation through the elemental realm. And he said, that is actually exactly what is described in the foundation stone. You go through three elemental realms, and then you the fourth is the, the, the meeting of the Christ. Um, and then we tried in at Emerson, we tried to say the foundation stone meditation twice. First we read it, and then we read it once more while we faded in. And that made just that reading made the fading in quite different oh it my became, god yeah it became the, you sort of the the entrance into the elemental world became let's say five times wider and it became 
elliptical. So uh, now I actually do that um, quite often. I combine the foundation stone meditation and the fading into the elemental world and hope that the elemental beings in east, west, north, and south can hear what we do. <laughs> Mm. And hope wow. that human and hope that human beings hear it. <laughs> you, you know, one of my teachers has been Werner Earhart, and I had Christ experiences through doing his work, asked in the forum. And he used to make statements like understanding is the booby prize. <laughs> uh. So uh, that is uh, important that I uh, remember to say to everybody that uh, it seems that the foundation stone meditation facilitates the entry or the passing through the elemental realm five times <laughs> to make it numerical. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So, friends, more questions specifically about your experience with exercises. So if uh, no questions, so I have one. Uh, Ari, so uh, the case <clears throat> of uh, Judith von Halle, what kind of uh, doors or what kind of method she is using? Because as I understand, this method is quite different than, for example, path of uh, 19 lessons of uh, first class. Well, I cannot answer that like uh, uh, I have, though, um, I have been thinking about it because, you see, you can observe where these three doors are leading into the spiritual world. The door of the elemental, they, it leads to a certain area of the spiritual world where you have access to the, the 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 good parts of the earth of the of the layers of the earth because you have already met the adversarial on the path while when you go through the door of the sun where you don't have to sort of personally meet the adversarial forces in in sort of face to face there you come into a area of the spiritual world where you have access to the nine evil layers of the earth uh, that is one one huge difference on these two doors they, they lead into different areas of the spiritual world and as Steiner said in the lecture that I referred to earlier, that to 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 know the the whole spiritual world, we have to go through all three doors. So when uh, in the last books of Judith von Halle, this five volume work that just came out, called uh, the Word or Das Wort, she described the. Uh, the layers of the earth in quite many over quite many pages and there she described the the nine evil layers very very carefully so i suppose from that that she had has gone through the door of the sun although it might be another or slightly another or totally another for that matter path to that door that is possible 
So that is what I can comment on that, but I, I don't know that because then you have to walk that path yourself to really know that. And she has a very, very special background with the stigmata and her relation to Christ and, and so on. <laughs> but oh, but uh, that is quite interesting because uh, I have this understanding now. We've really been working since last time on understanding the these three doors, which I did not understand enough before. And many of the questions today is about the different paths into the or different doors. Every door has also different parts into the spiritual world. So that is uh, almost like a synchronicity that brings me uh, help and, and, and uh, courage on the further path. Thank you for that, everybody. Yeah, I think it's important, this topic, because uh, my experience of Rodolf Steiner that he was very flexible and very open to different approaches to spiritual world. And he actually described some of them. For example, this is new introduction to, uh, uh, in the lecture, what we usually mentioning, this is lectures, uh, um, course in, uh, in Helsinki, 1912. He gave additional uh, exercises, which are, uh, exercises from uh, first lecture when we are using our normal eyes and uh, looking in the uh, physical world in order to unveil and uh, finally meet uh, another layer of Maya, which is uh, etheric world or uh, a world of elements. So, and uh, if you remember in the karmic lectures, uh, it was description of exercises, which is done by knights of uh, round table. So they were gazing in the bay. So they were gazing into sea. And uh, specifically when sun is playing in the, uh, in the water. And they've been observing elemental beings. Mm. And of course, I mean, all kind of inspirations they were getting out of this particular exercise, according to Rudolf Steiner. Uh, another example, it's actually example of Goethe. Uh, Steiner said he didn't uh, went too far in his exercises, but he was almost entering into the spiritual world by doing observation of nature, a certain object of nature. So, and uh, yes, and uh, uh, in uh, a contemporary anthroposophical society, maybe not now, maybe like five years ago, uh, we have a certain kind of um, uh, condition of being a little rigid. So like only one way, only uh, this particular thing. So I think it's important topic, just, you know, make, make observation quite wider. I mean, as a method of approach to spiritual world. Yeah, it was mostly statement. I'm not sure if you have any answer. Um, no, I totally agree what you say. I, I applaud what you're saying. Yeah, and uh, um, also I'd like to maybe, because we have certain posts, uh, maybe you can say a couple words about um, um, this Bulgarian, Bulgarian initiate. Um, Peter, do you know? Yes, uh, Peter, do you know? Dinov, Peter, Peter Dinov, in fact. Uh, so he's Bulgarian initiate. Because it's quite amazing. So if you specifically, uh, you mentioned, so he was uh, one of um, incarnation of Master Jesus. Which is, by the way, this is uh, individuality of Zarathustra. Am I right? Yes. And he wrote almost our contemporarily because he died in 1944, pretty close to us. And he he was born almost the same time as Rudolf Steiner, a year or so apart. 
and uh, and uh, they knew about each other because Peter Duno commented on Steiner and Steiner mentioned him once or twice. But uh, what do you think about by uh, mentioning him? What do you because he had uh, he had not that path at all. Not the path of knowledge. He was more into the, uh, as uh, it seemed that Rudolf Steiner, he was sort of fulfilling the obligations of the, the fifth cultural epoch, while Peter Duno, he was preparing the sixth cultural epoch. Uh, you can see the, it in, for example, Rudolf Steiner, he created Eurythmy, which uh, which uh, further the consciousness soul, while Peter Duno he created Pan Eurythmy, which is for the elemental beings. They told me that in when I was in Bulgaria up in the Rila Mountains, um, I as I as you know I always been watching the elemental beings, and. While I was watching Eurythmy, which I had been watching for many years, I wondered why the elemental beings never, were never smiling. They were serious. And the first time I saw an elemental being smile was when I was visiting the Amish people in America who do not use electricity, you know, they, they live sort of a religious life uh, in a, kind of quite special. There the elemental beings smiled. But when I was up in Rila Mountains and dancing Pan Eurythmy, the elemental beings were laughing. They were enjoying. They were in celebration. And I asked them, the leader of the, of the um, White Brotherhood, which they are called, and I said, is this observation correct? And she said, yes, this is totally correct. This is because pan is for the elemental world. And the element, elemental world is, uh, how did she express it? Is sort of the most important or the portal to or uh, what we have to work for more with in the sixth cultural age. That's why pan is for the coming age. And uh, Eurythmy is for this age, for sort of finishing this age or, or cons consolidating the development of this age of the consciousness soul. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, yeah, is next. Yeah, I would like just, if I may, uh, add a little something, uh, which uh, I take both from Andre and you, Are, and also from my own personal experience. I do not intend to justify my personal tendency towards the left door because <laughs> I, <laughs> because I understand exactly what you're telling me to do and I fully um, not just accept it but share the wisdom of it uh, but I think it's rather important it is something that I feel very strongly about um, it is true that it is important to consolidate but it is as true if not more so that we are already beginning to open towards the future, which uh, in practical terms could mean that if each of us can find one's own path, then we can, through our own karma, as well as through our own biography, find a way of becoming the link or the bridge between the consciousness soul and the sixth epoch. 
was it clear? Uh, does it need explanation? Not really. I, I totally agree with you. I Why I do this, why I at all wrote these books, why I, I, I tr use time is that today it is of utmost important as as many as possible go into the spiritual world by either door. The door of the death, the door of the elements, the door of the sun. And Steiner said we should go all three. But it is so important that we do it because if we don't do it, then we will not create this link, as you said, this connection between the fifth and the sixth epoch. Yeah, I feel a very strong urgency when yes. I talk about these things because I, I feel <clears throat> that unless we absolutely with commitment uh, do the work we are castrating the future from becoming a reality in mm. its own time i know mm. it's not just around the corner but it has already begun that's why i feel this urgency is not so far away that one can say uh, as an excuse well we we'll think of it when we get there um it has already begun inside of ourselves at least mm -hmm. as a hint and additionally as uh, andrew linnell the american uh, say is that it is so important today that we start to master the three occultisms because if we do not master the three occultisms then these fähigkeiten, these uh, abilities, will be taken over by the adversarial forces. And these three occultisms, uh, the hygienic occultism and the mechanical occultism and the eugenic occultism, uh, must be mastered within the next 3,000 or 2,000 years. Otherwise, it is sort of too late. Uh, and, and these occultisms can only be found or masters in the elemental world. Okay. The uh, hygienic occultism can only be masters if you go into the third realm of the elemental world. There you can do the healing. If you go into the second realm of the elemental world, there you can do the mechanical occultism, like Kili, Strader, uh, Schauberger, actually, too, and others. And if you go into the deepest realm of the elemental world, just before the threshold, there you can master uh, eugenic occultism. And I have had long discussions with those who try to work with the Strader machine or the Keeley machine. And uh, they have had a certain tendency to think that we could build this machine from our uh, here in the material world existence. But I disagree strongly with that. I think we have to go into the elemental world. And from there, we can actually do something uh, with machines or with weapons or with whatever. Because there we can Christianize the elemental beings of these machines. And that changed the effect this changed the working actually it changed everything with this machine so as you said it is so important that we do this but as i also said the the elemental path that gives you also additionally by to coming into the spiritual world it gives you also the possibility to work with the three occultisms that Steiner said is so important that we master within a certain time limit.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yaya. Um, uh, okay, Leon again. Um, you're free to answer or not, but this prom prompts me to ask about Omram Mikhail Ivanov. Um, I had a chance to attend some of his lectures when he attended um, events in Los Angeles many years ago. And he didn't he also have, have a pony with me? Was that similar? Yeah, uh, Mikhail Ivanhoe, he was a disciple of Peter Dunov. Oh, okay, that explains it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, the problem is that in several places in in uh, in Europe and maybe America, it seems that I have been to some of these uh, places and it seems that I have 100 pictures of Mikhail Ivano and none of Peter Duno. And, <laughs> Peter, and Peter Duno, he was the initiate. He was the important person, while uh, Mikhail Ivano was just a disciple. One, one of our, our, our group that went to these talks became a, a disciple of Ivanov, and I went to some of their gatherings. And I noticed that they had a kind of um, double, like a anthroposophists in, in many situations, where um, particularly I noticed in the women, they would dress rather like French peasants with blouses with puff sleeves and so on. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was quite noticeable in Rudolf Steiner College, the, the women would dress more like Germanic form. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So, uh, Penny, Dr. Penny Lopa. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hello, Ari. Hi, we can Hello. hear you. Yes, yes. Hi. I can't see Ari. What do I have to do? Ah. Yeah, you should choose speaker. You know, there is little icon view from your right upper corner. Yes. Yeah, press on speaker. Uh, hang on. Yeah, but anyway, we can hear you. Yes. If you have okay. a question, go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, Ari. Can I very quickly check on the correct pronunciation of your name, please? Um, is it Ari or is it Ore? Um, and is that Norwegian Swedish and is there a little circle above the A in your name or not? Not at all. <laughs> there is no <laughs> circle above the A because then my name would be Or, and ah, my name right. is Ara. Is it R like the in the A? Yes. Yeah. Ah. So, yeah. Ore. Is that yeah, right? order, order, an open A. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, was the other one Swedish versus Norwegian? No, order is Norwegian. And Swedish would be? I, they don't uh, have that name, actually. Uh, okay. I tried to consult Wikipedia and got very confused. So. Yeah. Okay. This is a very specific Norwegian name, I think. Thank you. It, now, has, it has two meanings. One is the eagle that flies over and see everything. And the other is the one that looks after the sacrificial fire. Ah, I had the first one, but not the second. Thank you. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and so eagle, son of Thor. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, um, I've got some um, downbeat problems to report, so I'm sorry if I lower the tone of the discussion for a few minutes. Um, I ran into trouble um, immediately after the last workshop 
I thought I was super confident. And then all of a sudden I began to feel very disoriented and unstable and shaky and as if I might be um, breaking up a bit if I, that, I mean that non-materially. Um, and what happened was that the, the cold shivering I described last time when I entered the second realm initially changed and it became a hard shuddering all through my chest. Um, if I can describe the feeling, if you imagine you're driving down an unsurfaced road with lots of ruts and corrugations in the surface and in the vehicle you're being juddered, do, 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 do. it was like those strong vibrations were going through my chest. And I started experiencing that unpredictably, it seemed, but at least once a day, and it had just come on for a minute or two and then dissipate. Um, then later, uh, and at that point, I felt I didn't want to actually push forward with practice. I wanted to stabilize myself a bit because I was feeling very ungrounded. Um, but then a week or two later, it was as if every external social support in my life suddenly disintegrated simultaneously uh, within the space of a week. And I'm guessing that all of this has to do with what I'm going through at the moment. Um, and I do feel the need to check back with you on these things because Back in the 1990s, when I got quite far on the path, things went very wrong and it took me a long time to recover. And I'm wanting to be careful that I retain my stability as I go through things again now. So that's why I'm reporting on some of these apparently minor things that are happening. Um, I'm not sure whether they're particular to me or whether they're things that other people experience going through the second realm. So I wondered if you care to comment on that. Yeah, I uh, will uh, do that. And I think, you see, when you meet the threshold between the second and the first, it feels like a, a real hard bump. So I think, and when you reach then the other side of that threshold, uh, like I said, that is that you lose all uh, support because you move into a vacuum. Mm. And everybody, uh, or everybody, <laughs> when I do that, go into that first realm, it is you lose everything you lose all stability and that is when i have to use the compass yes because then you have to set a course and go uh, it's like swimming in the night in the water you have to you, you have to set the course and uh, and go. That is very important. Otherwise, you go in circle. Or in the mist up in the Norwegian mountains, if you are attacked by thick mist, you go in circles. And then you need to have a compass in front of you all the time and follow uh, the, the needle. I, I think you actually are on uh, on 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 the first. I thought that might be the case, um, intuitively. So yeah. thank you, Sam, for confirming that, because yeah. I felt for many years that that's actually where I have work to do once I get myself sorted properly. Um, yeah. So that's very very important to me. If and, I can... and, and when you follow then the, this course, 
this needle, the compass, you need a compass. You, you just have it in your mind, you know, you have it in your heart. Then you will quite soon reach the real threshold where you meet the guardian. And then all your troubles are past because he will uh, teach you. That's wonderful. Um, in connection with that, um, one of the ladies last time spoke about her experiences of feeling bereft. Mm -hmm. um, and she'd mentioned that in a couple of workshops. And I wanted to pick up on that, um, just to add that all through this time, I've had this huge feeling of being abandoned, forsaken, outcast, that type of thing. And I would like to say at this point that one of my particular interests is whether the path is experienced differently by women to men, um, because I have a strong idea that there is a difference. Um, and so I'm wanting to document my own experiences as a, as a woman um, mm. where they might point up differences because I think that might be useful to others in the future. So this feeling of bereftness, I noted particularly when your other lady spoke last time, and I wanted to reinforce that that was very strong and it has been right through. Now, in my previous years in the 1990s, when everything went wrong, um, I worked through all that stuff and I thought I'd learned to live with it but it's as if it's all now coming back doubly strongly right through to the physical body. So that where previously it was more psycho-spiritual, it's now going right through into the physical body and having really deep effects. And so again, I'm just throwing that up for your response and any way it might be useful to others. So. Thank you. I have been uh which my wife have uh, pointed out several times to me that i have the experience of a man and it could be quite different at least experience as an experience for a woman so the man to cover both uh, sides so that um, I feel actually quite inadequate sometimes when women ask me for some advice and I I don't know what to say. I can only say it from the standpoint of uh, a stupid old Norwegian old Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So it would be worthwhile for me to document things as I feel them as a woman and just put that out for others to note and respond to that sort of thing. Very good. I'm very happy that you brought that up. Okay. If I'm allowed a little bit more time, um, this relates to the way I'm relating to people out in the world. Um, I've had the problem for years, as I'm sure everybody does, when people ask you what you do and then you try to tell them, and this is people who have no connection with, not just no connection with anthroposophy, but no connection with things spiritual at all. And so I found that you cannot say that you're Christian because they immediately think that you're a raging fundamentalist. And you cannot say that you're spiritual because then they think that you're a hippie. Um, and I'm still trying to find good means of communicating what a progressive spiritual path, a spiritual seeking might be described as to ordinary people in the community. And I know it's different in Australia, the US, Europe, Britain, um, but what I'm finding is that the only way I can describe myself authentically is, is as a pagan Christian. 
Um, and I find that works for me where um, describing myself in any other way is just not. And it seems to communicate with people out there, at least in Australia, in a way that other descriptions don't. So um, do you see any problems with being a a pagan Christian, because that's what I feel I am. <laughs> well, <laughs> when I was in Australia and I had a uh, walkabout sort of with uh, my colleague and my wife, and we were sitting down southwest uh, having a coffee, and then this almost naked female shaman came out of the bush, went to our table and looked at me and said, Walk with me, brother. And I looked at my wife and said, okay, I go with her for a few hours. <laughs> and she said, okay. And then we walked into the bush and she really explained me that one of the first Christians were the Aboriginal. They knew Christ had come. They had this close relation to the sun. She told me everything about Christ at that walk in the bush. And how the spirits was going after the death and so on and so on. And I realized that they were pagan Christians. And Christians more than most. And quite funny, when we then we went back after a few hours to the coffee table where we were still waiting, drinking the fifth cup of coffee. And um, this female shamaness you know, with almost no clothes. Somewhere she took out a card and say, handed it to me and said, if you if you have any questions, send me an email. <laughs> I, was, I was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've had connections with the native peoples in southwest Victoria. Mm. And the women are the women of the sun. Yeah. They, they know are, that. Absolutely. I know that, but no one else seems to know that. <laughs> so, yeah. but I got into trouble because, well, it's probably not the place, but that's when I first got into trouble because energies were released that I couldn't handle. And it, I've mm. taken an opposite path to most of you, I suspect, because I then... I had an experience of Christ directly in connection with the First Peoples. Mm. And I then couldn't handle the energies that were released. Mm. And I sent up a desperate plea for some means of understanding what was happening to me. And it was then within a few days that somebody arrived and knocked on my door with a handful of Steiner books. Now, mm. I've spent the last 25 years full-time on Steiner trying to put the opposite of what you're teaching, trying to put a conceptual framework on all of the things that have been happening to me because mm. I felt I could not be useful with all these things happening if I could not communicate those to others and make something of it. And so that phase has finished for me and I'm back into the other side of things, but I thought it was possibly interesting for people to know that we all come into this stuff in different ways, I think. And yeah. certainly the First Peoples of Australia, there's many, many different types of spirituality and they've had all sorts of inputs and nothing is pristine and pure and everything is being made a bit homogenous in a good cause at the moment, just to get a little bit of profile and respect. And we have a referendum on a voice to parliament for our First Nations people on the 13th of October. And we started off with everybody wanting to vote yes, and it has changed to people now wanting to vote no because of a concerted campaign coming now out we have, of the... now, we, now we have to keep to the what we are dealing with. So we have oh. to let the questions come now, I think. Uh, I can't get political. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, don't get too political now, please. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, one yeah. last very, very quick one. I 
watched a Swedish TV series called Jordkot, and I found it mysteriously compelling. And in that, there was an entity called the Hulda. And I wondered if you could explain to me a little bit what a Hulda is, because there was one point in that series where I absolutely identified with her. Um, yeah, <laughs> Hulda is a, is a Scandinavian a female elemental being of the third elemental realm. She is uh, extremely beautiful and seductive, and she have a, a tail. I have met her only once, and uh, at that time, you see, usually if you meet the Hulder, you uh, she twists your mind for the rest of your life. You you become uh, sort of uh, lost in her. But I was so lucky that uh, at that time she was she didn't try to seduce me. She was she was crying. She sat uh, between that was in the forest. She's the the guardian of the forest, and she was crying. And two Hulder men were trying to comfort her. Although she was extremely seductive, I still feel this feeling of seduction. Uh, 40 years later, but two days later, the huge machines came and cut down the forest. That's why she was crying. This came but, up in the, this came yeah. up in but now, the, but now we the, have the, to go on. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Andre. Yeah, well, I was muted. Elizabeth, can you hear us? Elizabeth, yeah, go ahead with your question. Yes, I can hear you. So I have um, a, a, a pad here. I've written down little tiny things. Well, not little things, but separate things all along this conversation. Elizabeth, uh, could you just unmute yourself? Uh -huh. Okay, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. So, yes, I've got, what I have here is just um, little bits of bits of things, little notes that I've made throughout this conversation, and they don't necessarily relate to each other, and I might not say them all anyway, but I'll just start where I really wanted to start was a long time ago, um, just about the, um, I mean, uh, I, I'm not somebody who can know, who knows a lot about it, but I'm just saying with the, um, the uh, 19 lessons and with many other of the verses, um, it's so much also the rhythm and the actual uh, phonetic sounds that that are a direct um, road to the content of 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 whatever it is that's being said. Um, it's now half an hour ago that we were talking about that, but I I just wanted to add that in and. Well, that's really the main thing. Also, just to to, to say that uh, I, I'm not somebody who knows something. It's just these are things that I've thought. Um, it's just many times if you take, you know, something from Steiner and maybe in your mind you're thinking, this is right, this is everything, this is you know, you might have that feeling about whatever it is um, that you're looking at. But sometimes it can happen that um, you'll be looking at, well, whatever it is, um, and then you'll see that he's not actually putting it down in stone. He is, sometimes he even changes 
things. Um, and it, it can turn out that it's it's really more of just a, a, a signpost um, than a sort of a great big declaration of that this is the, you know, this is the truth and this is everything and whatever. So, um, One of the things I wanted to say was about this commenting page. I never have found it, whatever email it is or whatever. I just wanted to say that here. Um, um, and the other thing is that sometimes it seems to me that, um, you know, we're talking about different places, different levels, different realms, and it it seems as though it's all so orderly, like you'd see it up on a map. You are here, and that's there, and that's that. And, um, and oh, is this coming back to yourself that, oh, I know where, so now I know where I am now. I know where I am. But sometimes it seems that um, we might be just looking at this all the time, but we don't really, we're not completely conscious of it. Look at, uh, we're looking at these realms all the time and they're interweaving all the time. And we're going into different, you know, different places all the time. Um, and maybe sometimes we just don't realize it. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, do you have uh, a question to Ari? <laughs> Do I have a question? Um, I'm asking because, you know, some person is waiting to ask questions. Oh, so I'm really sorry. Kind of... Okay, I'm very sorry. I, I, um, well, you could say that everything I said is actually a question, but I don't need, I don't need, um, no. No, it was it was more of a sharing of sort of things. I see. Okay. Okay, Ari, any any uh, response to it, or we can just continue. We we continue, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so Justine, Justine, can you hear me? Um, I made a distinction last time, last workshop between. Um, I, I'm heard, right? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yeah. Um, between my own spiritual path and the spiritual path that I may help with uh, patients. And, um, well, that, that I need to practice merging with the elements. And I have done that. And as I go into, um, let's say, the flame, I've started seeing Luciferic beings. And at the same time, I began seeing Luciferic beings, I believe, coming out of patience and um, as a bright flame coming up. Um, and then I began seeing more harmonic beings in the elemental world and um, started seeing spotted darkness around them. And um, my question is, how do I know after seeing these elements in patients, how do I know when I have transformed them as I work at a 90 degree angle or how I feel called to do that? If you uh, can observe an elemental being, then you know very well when you have Christianized it because when you open it, you make a crack, you open it, you push it some opening, and then you ask Christ to enter three times. And then the elemental being change in appearance. It becomes shining around the heart area. It becomes bigger around the chest. And the effect is uh, changing. Uh, it 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 um, it has a very different effect as before. It is not pathological anymore, 
And uh, there was um, homeopath, you know, homeopathy works often like cures like. So the elemental being of a homeopathic preparation is very like the uh, elemental being of the disease. And she wanted to Christianize her uh, homeopathic remedies. And when she did that, they changed appearance. So they didn't work anymore like they did. They changed in effect. And, and that is how it does when you Christianize then the elemental being of the herbal medicine or the homeopathic medicine they don't work in the same way. So it's better to go directly to the elemental being of the patient and change that because then it uh, changed the effect and become non-pathological. Yes, but you see it very clearly when you have done that. And I think my problem is that when I see them, it is very short. It doesn't last my time. Okay, yeah. Well, then you have to work on your uh, concentration in a way <laughs> to see them longer. But that is just an, that is, in my opinion, just a training. Judith von Halle, she commented once on that. She said that she could keep it for uh, about this connection for about 10 minutes. And she commented that Jules Steiner could keep it for an hour. And uh, so, so this is uh, more a, a training actually. And most people can keep it maybe for let's say 10 seconds, 50, 20 seconds, or, or something like that, at the beginning, in the beginning. Just go on. Okay, uh, Justina, that's it? Okay, thank you. Okay. We have uh, next, it's uh, Dijana. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I wanted to, hi, Ari. Um, I wanted to check check with you, please, um, the about the Christianizing of the elementals. So I have heard that we should do it in... I'm sorry, can you unmute yourself, please? So it's my mistake. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that... Uh, that it should be done in uh, in three directions. Um, can you say about that a little bit more? Yes, I can, because that I have worked very much with and very hard with. Uh, as the as I in the beginning, I only did one direction, like this. You see me? Yeah. I did that in the beginning like this. And that worked actually quite well, but then I wanted to work. So I started in two directions. Then I continued in three directions. You know, the Luciferic moves in this direction, the Arimanic in this direction, and the Asuric mm -hmm. in this direction. And, uh, but in three directions, did not work as I wanted it to work. So uh, now I have um, tried other directions. And for me, what works best is first this direction, and then this direction, and then this direction, like uh, a cross. Not this cross, but this cross. So I do now the, these three directions. All are in the same plane not in three planes as I did um, tried for a, a number of a period of time, but in one plane, but three directions in that plane. Yeah. Thank you. So, Dijana, do you, are you good? Okay, excellent. 
So, dear friends, we are working uh, one hour and 35 minutes. So, it just looks like only now we we having good substantial questions. So, uh, yeah, uh, can you be more active because time is running? Uh -huh. um, yeah, there is uh, from Leon again. So, but uh, I'd like to encourage some different participants to ask a questions because Leon asking already third time or maybe fourth. Um, okay. Okay, go ahead, Leon. Thanks, Andre. <laughs> We're Andre and our friends, so. <laughs> um, I want to go back to the um, the death door. Uh, and I feel kind of compelled to raise this topic. I, I didn't want to bring it up at the beginning, but since you were here before, Ari, a, a movie has been released in this country called Sound of Freedom, which has been produced very professionally. Like <laughs> it, it, it has competed with all the major releases of movies this year, and it's done very well strictly by word of mouth rather than the usual promotion and it's about child trafficking and I'm concerned about this whole business that you raised very briefly about the negative aspects of uh, this door and child sacrifice and uh, what I was struck by the, the release of this movie was that it was prevented, once it had been produced, it was prevented for several years from release by Disney Studios particularly. And then when it came out, it was attacked both in the TV stations and magazines in an insane way. It's, it has no politics politics about it. It's, and it's not, And it's just a story about one man's efforts in this area. But it raises the question for me to you. Do you also see that this is a major problem? What do you mean a problem? Child sacrifice, child trafficking well, for organs, child... Well, well um, you know, my especially when I went to uh, veterinary school, that most veterinarians in Norway, they are hunters and i've been watching people who were killing animals i have been working in a slaughterhouse for three years uh, where they were killing hundreds of animals even those who fish uh, they fish a fish and then they take the knife and and kill yeah. uh, cut the head in that moment the path to the door of death opens in a few second, seconds. And I was quite convinced when hunters talk about this, I asked several of my colleagues, why can't you just take a picture of the animal? Why do you have to shoot it? And I say, yeah, because that gives another feeling of oneness with nature. And that is when I wa watched it clairvoyantly. I, they really it it did it it does, and that is for each killing, even each fish you kill, you are closer to the door of death. But through the killing, it is uh, uh, the, that is sort of the left hand path. That is the black path, yeah. like the Mexican mysteries. So when the the uh, the first people of America, they, when they killed, they said that they made a prayer and asked, uh, that is, of course, to prevent that they became black magicians. So then you sort of ask for forgiveness. This is not for an initiation. It is just for food. And that does it a different way. So when you kill a human being, that is far, far more sort of 
what shall I say, effective uh, on that black path. You don't say, excuse me for killing you, and then you kill a human being. You don't say that. So this is terribly, and of course, when you kill the younger people or more innocent people, you kill the innocent in, in inverted commas, the 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 more it brings you to that uh, door of death there is another way to the door of death another path that is to really live the passion of christ when you really experience the passion of christ uh, then it also brings you to the door of death but that in a a, a good way a way um just to add to this the man who plays the lead in this movie did just that he if you've seen the movie the passion of the christ he was the christ in that movie and he had a profound spiritual experiences through that yeah i can think so yes and that is the right way to uh, to go close to the door of death that is by by feeling by pitying or uh, feeling the pain of people who die or watch people die or help them die or help them pass the threshold and not by killing that does it totally wrong and they will end up then in further incarnations as black magicians and will be lost for eternity for our human striving on our common path wow. to, the, to the Jupiter incarnation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we have about 20 minutes to the end of session. So Ari, maybe any new um, aspects or new exercises which you can give us for next time? Yeah, the, the exercise is uh, to, 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 to do not put concepts on yourself. You stop yourself. That is, the, uh, I think, that is so important what uh, some of you have indicated and seem to be uh, managing that is to just passing through just passing through like leonard cohen sings passing through sometime happy sometime blue <laughs> just passing through just like swimming in water that is the importance that is not what you do but how you do it that is the the main thing i will i will urge you to do it's so not so important if you do the the blue of the sky or the white of the snow or a flame or a salt crystal or or whatever it is how you do it that you you do don't do it from your intellectual head and think oh now i do this you just float into it with your heart yeah but it seems that some of you or several of you now start to understand how you stop yourself and that is by putting a, to say it intellectually a concept on the percept mm -hmm. Good, thank you so much. And um, uh, so people asking about of, about way of communication. So if you can discuss. Yes, um, I, I will be happy to do that, but I have not. Um... <laughs> this is... Maybe, um... God, it's. I think that is a little difficult for me to uh, to do on a daily basis. In England, when I was now on Emerson, they made a WhatsApp group, and they are it is vibrating with comments, and and they are quite clever, 
actually in in entering the elemental realm and then somebody said are why are you not commenting uh <laughs> i am i don't think i am that able to do it so if andre could uh, send me in a mail for example the, some questions uh, that I could comment on uh, I could be able to do it but I'm not really able to do this on a daily basis to yeah I'll be happy to I'll be happy to so but uh, we can continue just um, um, one, wait a second uh, Penny let me just finish so I'll give you time um, uh, yes so if you will continue to send at the same email so but you should know it's not uh, uh it's going to be open information because you know i will copy and paste it so this is only thing what we have to discuss so you should know so andre will open it and at least you know look at briefly and you know copy and paste it so it's yeah. not only between you and ari like kind of uh, highly intimate relationships, you know, through <laughs> email, through email, you know, just yeah. Sometimes some some questions are intimate, you know, really. So you should know about it. So, but you know, please send on the same email account which I mentioned. So and uh, once in a while, maybe once a week. So I will check it and uh, send to our questions. So Penny, uh, so what's your question? Go ahead. Um. I wanted to suggest a slightly different approach. I was wondering if technically there is any way we can set up a space where we can all post comments and we can discuss things with each other and Ari could basically just glance at it from time to time as he gets a chance. I'm very aware that as time goes on, the demands on him are going to become impossible time-wise. And so I'm trying to think of how we could be more efficient. But I also am feeling a real need to be able to communicate with other people in the group between workshops, because two months is a very long time for those of us who don't live near other people physically. Um, but I don't know. I don't want to put more demands on your time either, Andre. And um, I was just wondering, can Rudolf Steiner Chicago set up some sort of post box chat room? I don't know what the word is, but somewhere we can all just post comments and chat with each other spontaneously as the need arises and Ari can check in when he feels like it. Would that be a possibility? Yeah, one one of our suggestions can be Facebook account, for example, so we can do it. Let me discuss with our younger generations, which are good with uh, computers and um, all kind of programs. Yeah. But if you have any suggestion, please do. So uh, we have blog in our website. So, but I'm not sure if it if it will be a good place for particular topic. For particular discussions so um yeah but you know please uh, send suggestions so but i will discuss with our technicians and uh, yeah but until we will decide so please do i mean our old way so send uh, questions and i will just forward it to our works penny works <laughs> what did you say is it work um, for you Yes, it works. Works. OK. All right. Um, good. I had a question that Ari did not respond to because I think he didn't actually get it. I wondered if you were willing to tell us your time of birth. We rather find the next uh, day that we have this for the seventh meeting. I will get my agenda. And sure. Fine. 
No, I don't like to be analyzed uh, like that you suggest. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm quite introvert and personal in many ways. <laughs> So we're um, looking in the end of um, November, right? It will be the end of November, uh, September, October, November. Let me see. Or it can be uh, even uh, December 2nd or okay. November 25th. Oh, I can't wait. The end of, yeah, that is, um, wait, no, no, no. The second of December, I am teaching in Germany, and there we can do it. The ninth of December is free for me. Okay. All right. Same. Let's mark it. Yeah, ninth of December, the same time, eighteen hundred Norwegian time, and whatever time. <laughs> 11 a.m. in Chicago, central time for U.S. And here is one more question of from Christine. Yeah, go ahead, Christine. Please unmute your machine now. I have. Hello. Um, Ara, is it possible to come to your teaching in uh, Germany? Because it's it's for... Um, for um, yeah, of course. Doctors, mostly course okay fine it's possible to come to any of my seminars or workshops or teachings yes okay so for that in um in the netherlands isn't uh, a time fixed in the moment yes there it is it is oh actually, it's now fixed it seemed to be fixed one moment the Holland is Holland is twenty six to twenty eighth of January. Thank you. In and, Den Haag. And then Australia is <clears throat> one to three four of February. Fine, but a little bit far away. Yeah, and then we have one in Edinburgh and one in London and one in Tintagel, one in Bergen, one in Norway, one in Gothenburg and a few in Germany also next year. Oh, fine. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not longer on Facebook, so I can't see that and uh, I can't get to their dates. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and for our Canadian friends, and by the way, for Americans too, it's uh, so you will be soon in Canada, right? Yes, that is just a few weeks. Right. A few weeks, yeah. And this is uh, what? What? What town is it? Oh, Toronto, I believe, right? Yes, yeah, something like that. Let me see. Let me see. We go to first the 16th to Toronto, 17th Halifax, uh, 20th of uh, October, back to Toronto. And then uh, 23rd of October from Toronto to Montreal. And then 24th from Montreal to Vancouver. And stay, it seems I stay in Vancouver from the 24th of October till all the time to 30th of October. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, Michael Frosch. Michael? Yes. Michael, this is Hello. Michael. This Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been involved in organizing um ara's visit to canada hello ara um so uh, the one thing that you missed out ara is that you'll be visiting duncan i think from the 24th to the 26th okay. and then and then spending thursday evening to sunday evening in vancouver 
yeah. and and uh, each each uh, location where where uh, Ara will be has a mix of um, uh, talks and uh, workshops, except for Montreal, where you're just I think doing a well, even there, I think you're doing a a, a workshop in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. We're really looking forward to uh, hosting you. Thank um, you. For, for this trip. Thank you for making the time. Ara. I know it's a big chunk of time and a long way to come, but it's a long path, long way. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Compared to hopping over to the rest mm -hmm. of Europe. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we look, we look forward to seeing you soon. And people are very welcome to join. If you uh, live within travel distance of any of those locations, it would be wonderful to see people from, uh, from the south of the border coming up. And north border of U.S. And yes, and of course north of the border. Because it's 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 close. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Andre. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, dear friends. Uh, so very last thing. I mean, Ari or friends, uh, last uh, questions or statements, and uh, and we will probably conclude our our meeting. Any, I mean, is it? Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Penelope, she's quite active. Yeah, okay. No, 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 we cannot hear you, Penelope. Is that better? Yes. Yes, it's much better. Would it be possible for those of us in this workshop to tune into the Canadian workshops? Are they going to be online and could we be notified if so? That's for those of us not in the States. At the moment, um, I don't, I'm not sure which centers are actually planning to video and that's not something that we've discussed with ara so um i'll check in with ara about that and see if any of the 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 locations even have the wherewithal to to do that and and will, are willing to set up i know toronto has said that they're not going to do it whereas last year when ara visited toronto they did uh they did uh video um no, they didn't do a live uh, a live session, but they videoed it and then posted it later for people to watch. Yes, so. I discovered your videos from last year, and I found them fascinating and noticeably different in many ways from the United States ones. Um, so anything that's possible, I'd be really grateful for. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll discuss that with Ara and see where we go with that. Right. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, some comment from Christian. Yeah. Um, I send it on that uh, email we we got from you, um, Andre. Question for Ara. Um, before, but it was maybe too short before we start that meeting, because we are yesterday. It was the day of Michael, and everywhere it's always in the anthroposophical surrounding it's archangel michael and nobody is realizing the situation that that has changed and um so because i'm also in that work with um, um special needs children and people we 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 like to do that festival and how could we do that now for the situation we have also to to, to come into that contact with Vida. Can you say something about that, Ara? Well, I think actually Andre can say something about that. As they, in Chicago, they celebrated both the Archangel Vidar celebration, the Vidar Mass, uh, and the uh, Archai Mikael celebration, which is called uh, sometimes, as you said, the Archangel Mikael, yes. Yeah. Can you say something about that, Andre? 
Yeah, it's a, a festival which is in the very beginning. So, but anyway, so this is uh, uh, August 20th, according to Ari. Hmm. According so, to Vidar. <laughs> yeah, according to Vidar, <laughs> his day is uh, August 20th. So, and uh, what we did, it's uh, quite simple. So it was like two type of activity, artistic activity, uh, which is uh, singing. And it was um, some young, our young members, they, uh, they composed uh, uh, a piece, which is song for Vidar. And, uh, and uh, for example, Sergei Prokofiev, he, um, I think part of his book, um, uh, Cycle of the Year as a Path of Initiation. So they have very nicely done a, um, a article or chapter, which is Mystery of Vidar. So which is quite informative. So it's a lot of uh, done from Steiner. He just put everything together, which uh, pretty much like spiritual biography of uh, this particular being. So it's it's very interesting to realize because uh, Vidar he was involved in uh, in many stages and many events of uh, human evolution and also in mystery of the Golgotha. Yes, I studied that uh, chapter in Prokofiev's uh, book, and so I was also wondering who is Balder. So. Uh, <laughs> But I, I wrote that in before and and thought maybe Ara didn't read that now, um, that question before, so I waited. But maybe you can, um, can you uh, share that uh, song for Wida? I think, I think it's somewhere even on uh, online, so I can... If you if you will email me so I can just give you a link, I will try at least. Thanks. So, yeah, sure. Okay, dear friends, I think it's time to conclude our uh, meeting. And uh, uh, I would like to thank Ari for, for his time and uh, joining uh, and for joining us. Um, yeah, and uh, if you would like, please unmute your machines and you know and uh, say word of thank you and uh, goodbye to Ari. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Andre, for organizing it always so brilliantly. Yeah, thank you, Ayaya, for joining. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Andre. for opening it so quickly. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Andre. Yes, thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> thank you, Ayaya. Thank you. All right. Bye, I'll everyone. see you. Bye. I'll see you next time.